and good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here, and thank you to, uh, to the ministry, uh, to the agencies and organizations that have really developed this uh, proactive approach to, to looking at the industry. And, and I'm sure that, in my mind, the, the presence of the minister here this morning highlights the significance and importance of the work that you're doing. Uh, I, I also would be remiss if I, if I didn't thank the person that we've had most contact with as speakers, and that's Anna Christina and her colleagues that had the tenacity and the attention to detail to make sure that everything kind of came together. So thank you, uh, and thank you to our uh, excellent uh, translators as well. I, I'd like to start a little bit with some of the social challenges that come with the industry. Uh, some of the things that come along that maybe we don't see quite uh, like we do in like these things. We heard yesterday about the, uh, the first well that was drilled in the Titusville, Pennsylvania area. And this came shortly after that. And this is a, in Pennsylvania, this is kind of a famous photograph of what it looked like on that hillside. And if you saw the hillside today, uh, it doesn't look anything like this. It's tree covered, it's, uh, it's got grass on it. Nature has reclaimed this site uh, to look completely uh, changed from what it did in the day that that picture was taken. So as we think about social challenges, it's, it, the things that we see uh, change dramatically as we get up close. Uh, from, a, from the distance, you can barely see the drill rig off in the distance across the mountaintops. When you get up close, you, you see that there is something there, that there's an impact on the, li on the landscape. And, and speaking of attention to detail, thank you. Um, let's see. So we know that there are things that come with it. And in this photograph from uh, northeastern Pennsylvania kind of gives you a lot of the impact that you get with, with the physical impact that we see with a, with a, uh, a drilling operation. So we have the pad site. Uh, there's a pipeline coming in from this direction. We have a compressor station up in the upper uh, part of the uh, photograph. And of course, of course water impoundments uh, that are part of this drill site. And so those are the physical things that we see as we drive down the road. And in my community, this is what people will notice and talk about first before they talk about other things. There, is a, a, there are bookshelves full of literature on boom towns, on the research that has been done. So we know what some of that is. We know what the influence is on populations, on culture, on the housing and, and, and social environment and communities. We know that in general, and this is speaking in general, that local governments aren't, aren't prepared for this because it hasn't happened to them before. So they don't know what to fully expect. And so this is new. They don't know how fast to plan. And, and as we know, that some sectors will, will benefit more than others uh, with the industries moving in. In Pennsylvania, and I'll be talking about the Pennsylvania, you know, I'll, I'll, give, I'll call it the Pennsylvania experience. Uh, it is our experience is what some of us have seen in Pennsylvania and experienced. I'm not trying to forecast what other people will see or experience. And in fact, it's in the hands of many of us uh, to, as, it, uh, as it develops for us to, uh, to let it develop. Pennsylvania has a long history of boom and I'll say bust. Uh, we went through timber and coal and, and strip mines, uh, long uh, deep, uh, deep underground coal mines, limestone, and the industry that came with those resources, steel and glass. And in my community, I can look around at the ethnic mix that's there, and it's a direct result of the resources that we had in my community. So we have a large Italian uh, community uh, in, in my area. The, the Italian immigrants came to, to this part of Pennsylvania because we had limestone quarries, and they were skilled uh, masonry people. The Polish immigrants came into our community because we had a steel industry and they were accomplished in, uh, in producing steel. Uh, so our, our community where I live looks like th and is a direct result of the resources that we had that were developed there. And, and our school district looks the same way and is reflective of that of course. This is again from literature that we know that there are certain stages that we, uh, that we see communities go through as an industry moves in. And it, develop, and it starts with this kind of euphoria that, 
there is uh, something new and exciting, that there's something here that's good. And we kind of overlook the rough edges right at the beginning of, uh, at the stages of a, of a boom. And as it develops, then we become to see, we see a little uncertainty. Maybe those rough edges that, you know, that we were willing to ignore at the beginning, now we start to focus on them a little bit and see what they are. And we go to that area of concern where, where things start to grow faster. And I heard Secretary Hanger say yesterday, in response to a question, what would be a good pace? And he said, uh, if uh, paraphrasing, 5, 10, 15, 20 wells might be a good start. And that was our start in Pennsylvania, 5, 10, 15, 20. And over the course of a couple years then, we got to where we were drilling 2,000 Marcellus Shale wells a year. So we went through that stage of concern where it grew very fast and we saw, uh, we saw the industry grow. We saw the physical things happen in our community. And then the adaptation phase where we start to plan and, and think about the future and what are the ramifications and how can we as leaders in a community plan for what it will look like, what our community will look like when, uh, when the resource is exhausted. So let's talk about some of those impacts that a community sees and feels. And some of them are the see and feel part. You know, it is, uh, when a drilling rig is active, it's an it's a expensive operation. So it, it operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It really doesn't matter what the weather is. It's hard work, and there's somebody out doing the work. And, and in my community, we have what I call our gawkers. So people that love to drive down the road where the drill rig is and take a look and slow down and take pictures and create a little bit of traffic problems. We have lights that are unusual. We have lights that are on 24 hours a day during the drilling process. It kind of, you know, if, you're, if you live uh, through an trans electric transmission right, or, uh, right away on my farm, I can see a drill rig over uh, on the next property. And as I drive down my little lane to my house, at night I can look off to the right and see the lights that are there that were never there before. And, and it's just interesting. And of course, we heard yesterday about uh, truck traffic, about the amount of traffic that increases because of that. Uh, when you increase people, you increase traffic. Of course, there's a probability that, that accidents or some other occurrence will, will come along that requires the services of police or emergency management personnel. With that increase in people, we see changes in enrollment in high schools. And some of that change is on the upside, is it, it increases. And then as, as some of this is transient, some of those people move. And it, and it takes a burden off the school, if you call it a burden. It's, it's a burden for administrators to figure out how many teachers to have and what are the right classes to have for those students. And of course, with an increase of people comes an increase in demand for housing, housing and apartments. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a, little, in, in a few moments. As, as these occur, of course, you know, we see unemployment, the unemployment rate decline in a, in a community there are increased number of jobs. And what we heard quite often in Western Pennsylvania, really across Pennsylvania, was that, uh, look, you're, you're bringing all these people from out of state. They all have a southern accent. They all talk different than us. You're bringing them all to Pennsylvania to work here. And while they needed, while I think the industry needed to bring expertise in quickly to, to, do this, to have the skills and the expertise that they needed, what we see today are seven or eight out of every 10 new employees are local people, are Pennsylvanians, are peop the people that get out of those, uh, we, we call them the white trucks. The people that get out of those white trucks are Pennsylvanians, they're people from our community, people who work there. They're people that uh, perhaps had some skills uh, that now have jobs in the industry and, and, it's, and what has caused a little bit of, you know, it's, it, it has caused some consternation because many of the skills that are required on a job site are very similar to those in other industries. So maintenance, excavation, repair are also jobs that are transferable from, from other businesses in a community to the natural gas or natural, uh, and natural and oil business. 
And in an industry that pays a little bit more, it's difficult sometimes for some of our local uh, employers to retain the employees that they have because they have an opportunity to work someplace else and, and, and increase their income. In the process of this, of course, we've mentioned homes and the increased uh, demand. It's a supply and demand uh, kind of thing so that as, as our population increases in an area, the pressure on home sales increases a little bit. The pressure on apartment rents comes up. And in fact, in some cases, in, our, in some communities, we've seen where local people really have been priced out of the market, that the prices uh, that, that people that owned homes or owned apartments could charge was increased because the people that were coming in and working in the industry were willing to pay a little bit more than what the market had been in that community. So it's, uh, so it's caused a little bit of, of that kind of uh, uh, quandary. Thinking about land impacts, Pennsylvania has 46,000 square miles. Uh, we had 12.7 uh, million people in 2011, so I want to give you some idea of the size of it. Uh, to give you some, uh, and what I intend, what I hope to do here is to show a little bit about uh, a little of the impact that the number of wells that will be drilled in Pennsylvania will have. I'm using a conservative number of about 100,000 wells in Pennsylvania in the Marcellus Shale. And if you talk to any of us from Pennsylvania, you would get a different number, maybe up to 260,000. So the, 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 the number has a broad uh, range from low to end. But I'm using uh, 100,000, and that would equate to about 18,000 well pads. And at about six acres of well pad and at six wells per pad, that gets to about 108,000 acres that would be disturbed in a, uh, in a state that has about 46,000 square miles. So proportion-wise, it's relatively small. And I should say that Pennsylvania is a, it, we, we think of ourselves in many ways as an agricultural state. Uh, some would claim that agriculture is the largest industry in Pennsylvania, dairy being the, the largest agricultural product that we produce. Going from 108,000 acres, as it's reclaimed, would get down to about 20,000 acres. So in total, a relatively small footprint to extract the resource that we have in, in our state. I mentioned that we're an agricultural state. About 47% to date of the wells that have been drilled have been drilled on agricultural land. Uh, you, know, you could argue that much of our agricultural land may require less ex uh, excavation, maybe closer to roads, maybe would have better access on and off. Of course, that leaves about 53% for forest lands. And, and I heard Catherine Mutt speak yesterday about the, the potential on forest land for invasive species, uh, for forest defragmentation, uh, for, uh, for a change in species based on the change that, that animals see. We know that there are some animals like, in a, I think about raccoons and opossums, deer, that, that really adapt pretty good to mankind. They really don't, uh, they adapt to us, our intrusion. But there are species, and Catherine can speak better to this, that do not adapt very well to mankind's intrusion. And at Penn State, that's one of the things that we're doing is, is doing some research to identify what those are and are there ways to mitigate that. And, and maybe I, I should have started by saying, as uh, I'm in the College of Ag Sciences at Penn State University, and our goal is not to advocate for or against the industry. Uh, our Penn State model is to take research that is done by our researchers at University Park and our other campuses and take that research and, and come out to our communities in Pennsylvania and transfer that research into knowledge, into something that makes sense on our community level. And, and really much of what we're talking about today is, is, is a result of that. So when we leave uh, a meeting such as this, our goal isn't to have convinced you one way or the other, only to provide you with science-based information that you can make your own decision. And that's what I know that we all hope to do in the course of, of this uh, discussion. And from a land use basis, one of the things that's changed in Pennsylvania is that we've seen the number of wells per pad 
increase over time. So it's doubled over the last four or five years to about 2.3 2 in 2011. And in fact, we have some wells in, in our southwestern corner of the state that have reportedly been permitted for 18 to 20 wells on a pad. Now, from an agricultural standpoint uh, and, and land use, that certainly makes a lot of sense. If we can put more wells on one disturbed uh, land, uh, one disturbed well pad, then it certainly uh, has less impact on our environment, it has less impact on our agricultural community, less impact on our communities, the more wells that we can put on a well pad. And we've seen that increase gradually in Pennsylvania. Some of the impacts continuing on with that is, re relates to infrastructure. You know, we, we know that gas isn't trucked out of the, uh, off the well pad. It's got to move by a pipeline. And, and, uh, and that really is one of the more visible, after a well pad, it's one of the more visible things that our community sees. It sees the excavators clearing a right of way. It sees the bulldozers pushing trees back for that right of way and the excavators to come in and dig the, dig the trench. I mentioned in one of those first photographs the compressor station. There are, there are multiple compressor stations in most natural gas plays that are part of the operation and they, uh, depending on how they're sited and depending on how they uh, generate their power, whether it's electric or natural gas, that they may be noisy. And so I know that you know, in, in Pennsylvania, much of industry is using a best practice of moving these back out of uh, residential areas, not putting them in an area where, they're, where there are homes, putting them back someplace where they won't have a disturbance on the community. I, I mentioned uh, to David Goldwyn this morning that we have, uh, in western Pennsylvania, not only are, are our wells producing methane, but they're also producing propane, butane, ethane. And before that gas goes into a pipeline, it's being going, it goes into a gas processing plant to separate out those other components. And really, that's why Western Pennsylvania has stayed alive in the natural gas industry, because of those added components which add value to the, uh, to the product and increases the value of the product being produced out of the wells. But in the process, in the course of that, I, I mentioned that in about a 100-mile radius of my house, we have four gas processing plants being built, rather large facilities, half a billion dollars apiece in construction cost, uh, three to four hundred construction jobs at each site, with a full-time employment of 30 to 40 people when they're completed. So it's a, it's a pretty big impact from the standpoint of here's a new industry that's being built here, and here are a lot of new jobs that are being built as part of that. And we heard yesterday about water treatment. David talked about water quantity and, and treatment, trucking. Uh, I'm going to spend a little more time in a moment on trucking and rail. I mentioned pipelines, uh, a view in on one of our southeastern, or excuse me, northeastern counties, and, and a colleague took this picture of a, uh, you know, if we, look, if we look at the upper right photograph, this is what it looked like as it was being developed. And after the initial uh, grass was placed and planted, uh, it, it, it's, it's been reclaimed to a, to a nice looking uh, uh, view. In some of, our, some of the parts of Pennsylvania, we have pipelines going up across mountains. And in, in, in some occasions, it's in an area where they depend a lot on the tourist trade. And the community had an immediate concern about what we call the view shed. What does this look like now? Is this changing the way tourists will view this as a, uh, as a destination? Uh, point to, to visit. And so there is a, that, com that concern from the community about what it looks like. What does it look like uh, cutting up across the mountainside with a, with a pipeline project? We heard about uh, the equipment that's involved in a hydraulic fracturing process, in the drilling process. Uh, it is a noisy operation. The, 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 the opportunity there is that it's also a short uh, time frame that this occurs. In a residential area, and uh, Catherine, you mentioned yesterday some drilling activity in, on college campuses. We have some drilling activity in western Pennsylvania that is relatively close to residences. And 
they can, you know, for the short amount of time, for the three or four weeks that the drilling operation is in, in effect, it could be a little noisy. And one of the, one of the mes methods that companies are taking to, to mitigate the noise is to put a, a noise suppression blanket around the site. And this is an example of that. And you can see the, the house on the bottom left-hand corner. You know, it's relatively close to that. And I, I'm sure they're, uh, they're happy for the best management practice that this company uh, integrated into their operation. I mentioned traffic. And we've mentioned a lot about truck traffic. This is a, a study from our uh, uh, Department of Transportation on four intersections in northeastern Pennsylvania. And Bradford County is one of our most drilled natural gas counties in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, it's a relatively sparsely uh, populated uh, county. It's an agricultural county and, and a forested county. The, what you can see in the green, the five-year average, as opposed to that kind of pinkish color, that in many cases, the truck traffic increased three or four times over the five-year average. And, and, the, and the passenger vehicle count increased, you know, sometimes double, uh, sometimes a little more than that, over, again, the five-year uh, five average. I spend uh, time every year at our Pennsylvania Association of Township Supervisors, uh, their annual conference. And one of the things that I hear inevitably from township supervisors as we talk about truck traffic, they will say, you know what, we had 500, we had 800 trucks going up and down this little township road. It was uh, tar and chip, or it was uh, dirt and gravel, and those are the kinds of roads that we have in, in Pennsylvania on some of our secondary roads. They destroyed it. They absolutely destroyed it. And then before they can take a breath, they will say, but the industry built us a road better than we could have ever built ourselves to replace and repair the damage that was done on the road. And I've never heard someone, never heard a township supervisor tell me anything different. Than, I'm sure there are some examples different than that. But the majority of township supervisors I've had a chance to interact with will tell you about the impact of truck traffic on their very lightly designed roads and that the road that the industry has provided them today as a replacement for that is so superior to a road that they would have built on their own or that they could have afforded to have built on their own. Uh, we mentioned yesterday about uh, some of the support industries and the, where the truck traffic comes from. If, if we think about 10 or 12 truckloads of sand for every frack stage, and if you have 8 or 10 or 12 frack stages, you know, you can just start to count the number of trucks that, that come in. And, some of these trucks, to, to an extent, have been moved off the road because of railroad cars. Railroad cars moving sand into a centralized depot where a truck picks it up and then moves it to the, uh, to the well, to well site. 17,000 feet, an average number, of steel casing being moved by truck to a well site. We just start to add up the number of trucks, I guess, is what we do. It, we heard again about water. Water impoundments, the number of trucks it would take to fill an impoundment such as this. And if I've got my pictures right, that some of the infrastructure that's been developed in Pennsylvania, and this is a photo from north, uh, northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, of, a, of a, three, a couple three million gallon water tanks that were built. Water is railed into this site. There's a railroad siding behind uh, these tanks. Water is railed into this site from out of state, pumped into these tanks, and then loaded into trucks and moved. So industry has moved a bunch of trucks off the road through a practice of using rail service. And additional to that, I think, David, you mentioned yesterday the use of pipelines to move water, fresh water, from one site to another. Again, a best management practice that industry has utilized to take truck traffic off the road, which is one of those impacts that our community sees first and causes some concern to, to those communities. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on workforce, but to mention, uh, because it's an impact on our community. I mentioned unemployment drops. Uh, Catherine mentioned 420 individuals, essentially, 420 pairs of hands that have something to do with every well site. 
150 different skills and occupations that have a hand in every, uh, every well site. And our, our, uh, some of our colleagues, Dave's and my colleagues, have, have done some workforce assessment and looked at, you know, it, about 75% of those jobs, if you, can, if you can read any of that, general labor, CDL in Pennsylvania is a commercial driver's license, so it relates to truck driving, general office, and heavy equipment operation. Again, about 75% of the workforce are, are blue collar types of jobs, opportunities for schools, opportunities for uh, technical and trade centers to provide training for our youth. And it, when I have an opportunity once in a while to speak with school guidance counselors, and uh, one of my comments to them is, here's an opportunity for our youth. We talk about the brain drain of Pennsylvania, that our youth have to leave Pennsylvania to find a good paying job, to find a job that that fits their skills and expertise. Here's an opportunity to train our youth for high paying jobs in an industry that is going to be here for decades and that these young people can enter the industry and they can retire from the industry if they choose and their children can probably do the same thing. I'm going to speak about that impact in communities in a way of looking at the stages of development through, the, uh, through this resource play. In the development phase that Pennsylvania sees themselves in, it's, it's when some of those 100,000, it's the period of that when those 100,000 wells will be drilled in Pennsylvania. The development phase are the number of people that are employed the, and the ancillary people that are employed to produce 100,000 wells and to have 100,000 wells producing natural gas into a pipeline. And it's all the support industries that come along with it. The production phase is then after the wells have been drilled and there's a maintenance. There, there may be some water or some other, uh, some other produced uh, products from a well that need to be trucked away. So there will always be somebody visiting the well site employment opportunities, and the reclamation phase. So looking at it, a colleague of ours, Tim Kelsey, uh, developed this, uh, this table. Looking at, in the blue, the production phase, or the development phase, when there is a relatively high employment, and, and as we have said, a high employment with a, in a relatively short time frame, but that's all relative as well. Relative to what? You know, if, if we think the Marcellus in Pennsylvania may have 50, 60 years of, of drilling activity. You know, do you call that a short time period? And in Pennsylvania, we have, as I've heard discussed here, potential for other shale plays that may produce and will produce natural gas and or oil or, or other natural gas liquids. So we talk a lot in Pennsylvania about the Marcella shale, and that's just really the beginning. That's the tip of the iceberg, because our footprint in Pennsylvania has overlying layers of shale that will provide additional opportunities that will extend that, the blue in this graph and the, and the development phase of this jobs. So it, it may be 100 years, or it may be 150 years. And, I'm sorry, and, and I should just comment that if back, it, the, as we drop and as the, say if it's 100,000 wells, if that's the magic number, as that, as that last 100,000th well is drilled, and then we start into the, into the production phase where employment drops relatively fast. And, and the thought here is that, well, first of all, will the leaders in our communities and this is, I guess, a rhetorical question, because we know this, that the leaders in our communities that are planning today for the future will probably not be the leaders that are there when, this devel when, the, when the development phase ends. And so it's a long-term planning process that our communities have to think in, and our local leaders have to plan for something that they're not going to see, but to set the stage and the foundation for future leaders to build on. In my high school, I can look out the windows uh, and see the results of, of, limest of limestone quarries, the, the mounds of, uh, of, of, of stone and rubble that were left. And if I look out to the other side of my high school, I can see the results of the strip mining activity that's occurred in our community. 80 or 100 years ago in our community, 
we didn't think necessarily too far ahead is what would happen after the coal was gone or after the limestone was gone. And, and we encourage our leaders in Pennsylvania to think beyond, this is a finite resource, to think beyond natural gas and its extraction. What will our community look like when the last gas well has been drilled? Will we have an excess of housing? Will we have a high school that's twice as big as we need? And so those are the impacts in our community that our local leaders are struggling with. And it's not, you know, I, I, I talk as if this is an easy, uh, easy thing to do. I, I know that there's a lot of thinking and a lot of planning and a lot of leadership that takes place to make, it, uh, make our plans uh, in place for the future. When we look at business impacts, uh, we've talked a little bit about some of these things. Business impacts in our communities, one measure is what's going on in our hotels. And we have communities in Pennsylvania that have added two, three, a half dozen hotels in the last two years or so. Why? Because there was a need for housing. There was a need to, to, to house people on a short-term or temporary basis in that particular community. And as you can see in this graph of about four years, that most of the sales tax taxes increased and doubled over a four-year period. So the level of activity doubled, and I would argue that because of some of the games that we can play in Pennsylvania with sales taxes, that perhaps this number would be even bigger. And so I'm not sure this reflects totally the, the impact, and I believe the impact is actually greater than what this, uh, than, the, than the sales tax receipts might indicate. Another is rail traffic. I mentioned that water coming in, sand coming in, steel coming into a community on rail. We have a lot of what we call short line railroads that were really just struggling to hang on, struggling to find a little bit of business to move some kind of product between two communities in Pennsylvania. Many of them have doubled or tripled their employees. They've, they've received enough money and income to improve the infrastructure, to extend some of their lines, rail lines, to improve the capacity of some of those rail lines. And this, uh, this count of rail cars is an indication of that. So in, in Bradford County, again, a very actively drilled county where a lot of sand and a lot of water is moving into it, a lot of steel is moving into it, you can see that the, uh, that the rail traffic into Bradford County you know, quadrupled over a four-year period. So it's had a tremendous impact on that community, uh, both in workforce and in the, in the ancillary businesses that support the railroad industry. And, and really, the railroad industry being a very small community in Pennsylvania uh, in this short line business. I'm going to move quickly to this socialization process and talk. I, I, I've already kind of mentioned some of the things that local leaders need to think about or be aware of. And, and, and I'll give you some of the experiences that we've seen in Pennsylvania and what local leadership has done and how they've accomplished some of that. Uh, we have some communities that have really been progressive in that they have uh, they've opened up their doors and they've opened up a line of communications with industry. They've opened up a line of communications with the local business people. They've opened up a line of communications with the residents of the, of the community. Because who do, you know, in, in Pennsylvania, I'd, I'd, I would argue that, that I would tend to go, and most of our residents would tend to go to our local leaders and look to them for information and have a higher degree of confidence in the information that we get from our local leadership than we might from someone at a state or federal level. And I'm not disparaging those folks, just we have a, a, a closer relationship, I think, with those people that live in our communities that we elect, that we see in the grocery store and at the gas station. And so it's very important in Pennsylvania that our local leaders do that. And some of our really, the people that have really taken the lead have done some of the things that I'll highlight here, and that is to hold town meetings, to hold a, a, a time when the community can gather and find answers to questions. And oftentimes our local leaders will bring in industry representatives, bring in business people, and really it's, it's exposing them to the worst kinds of questions and the toughest questions that a person could be asked. 
Uh, it's, as we know, it can be an emotional and a very passionate discussion. And we see that exhibited in some of our town hall meetings. I, I kind of highlight on the bottom right the Center County Planning and Community Development, the, the Natural Gas Task Force. And Center County is, wouldn't you guess, it's right in the center of Pennsylvania. And, and they had the foresight to put together a Natural Gas Task Force. They included residents, uh, local leaders, people from the natural gas industry, brought them together and started to think about what we want our community to look like and how can, how can the industry and the community work together to make sure that we have, as a community, what we would like to have when, when this industry is, or while this industry is here. And they have successfully uh, articulated that in some of the papers that they've developed that discuss what they would like to see in the community. And it, it's, it is truly bringing a, everybody together to, uh, to, a common, uh, to a common end. Uh, I mentioned uh, the consultation. Uh, the perception in, in our local leaders, I, I, I truly believe that, that the majority hope and want to have the ability to be as transparent as possible, to provide as much information to, to, their, to their community residents as they can. But that is really incumbent on them to start talking to the people that are in the natural gas industry. That's really incumbent on them to open up that discussion. It's a two-way street. And some of the issues that our community, and when we hear at town hall meetings, the questions that are asked, these are some of those questions that are asked. Are you prepared for an emergency? Or what, are you, what would happen if there was an accident? What happens if a, if a truck with, uh, with a load of chemicals uh, rolls off the road into a ditch. Are you prepared for that, Mr. Local Leader, for that to happen? And, and we have local uh, community vote technical schools, community colleges to address this. And I mentioned somewhere, maybe later, that this is an opportunity for our educators to provide this kind of education, to prepare to help our local leaders in the infrastructure development. A and we hear in town hall meetings, housing needs. What are you going to do? Uh, and, 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 you know, we will hear claps, applause at some meetings when somebody, a, a local entrepreneur, announces that they're going to build a motel or a new restaurant is going to be built. Because you know we don't like to stand in line to wait to get a table at a restaurant. And so this is, these are the kinds of things that impact the community in kind of subtle ways, but ways that, you know, we live every day. What are some of the economic development uh, opportunities that, that entrepreneurs have in this environment? And, uh, and again, workforce. What is the industry's role in this? And I'll go back to some of the same things. We really have, I believe, some progressive, some uh, advancing companies that are leaders in the industry in Pennsylvania that take this and, and really run with it and are, I would say, uh, those people in the, that are the A's, the companies that are the A's in the class that take leadership roles, that open up dialogue with local community leaders, that provide opportunities for citizens to get together. I serve on a local community task force that one of our local uh, natural gas companies put together. They bring leaders from the community together. The reason is they want to expose everything that they're doing to, to the community. They want to have an open discussion. They want the local leaders to see what happens in the natural gas industry. They don't want it to be a secret. You know, David talked yesterday about uh, the, the exposure of uh, fracking uh, fluids and, and the dissemination of the information to, uh, to the community. It was important to clear that hurdle because it took away a little layer of distrust and concern. If you're not willing to disclose that, then what does it mean? It just, you know, it might not mean anything, but to many people, it says there's a reason that you don't want me to know it. And some of our companies in Pennsylvania have been very advancing in this and opened up their operations to communities so that local people get a first-hand look at it so that when they see their neighbors at church or in the grocery store and there's a question, they can answer it. And so really, they become uh, some of the communication for the industry as well. Uh, community involvement, I, I just showed this little picture. Cabot Oil and Gas is a company producing uh, in Pennsylvania. They've teamed up with our, our local uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce to, 
to, to solicit funds. They've contributed largely to this. And that's what we see in Pennsylvania is that the natural gas industry has ingrained themselves into the community. They're part of the community. They take part in community activities. They support community activities. They provide grants and funds to agencies and organizations. I'm going to make a fast switch as I close down here to look at another perspective in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has an Amish community of about 45 or 50,000 people. Uh, they're traditionally agriculturalists. They're farmers. They immigrated uh, from, from Germany, Switzerland, the 1700s for religious region, reasons. They came, to, they came and found uh, a land where, uh, where they could utilize their agricultural uh, expertise and found that in Pennsylvania. Some of their, uh, some of their life is uh, no use of electricity, no use of vehicles, uh, uh, of motorized vehicles. Uh, many modern convenience, conveniences that we all take for granted, they do not utilize. And so, in, and, and we have a, an Amish community where I live. It's not uncommon to go down the road and see uh, a horse with uh, a buggy. Uh, transporting somebody uh, you know, to a neighbor or to the grocery store. Very conservative, uh, generally agriculturally minded, and, and they, their expressed desire is to see their farm extend for future generations. And in many instances, you'll see a farm that started out as 150 acres, that as the family has sons in the farm and they have large families, as the family has sons in the farm, the farm is divided up so that each son has a portion of the farm. The farm is very important. The land is very important. And if they outgrow that farm, they move and buy property elsewhere so they can, so they can expand the farm. Uh, the decision-making process in the Amish community is a little bit like any other mini community that there is a local bishop that is the head of the, of the church organization, which is really what the Amish community is. And that bishop hears input from the community, and the bishop makes a decision as to what we will do as, as an Amish community. And, and, and so if I move from the Amish community in my neighborhood and, and move 20 miles to another Amish community that we have in the area, they might have, and the bishop might hold completely different ideas about a particular subject. Natural gas development is one of those subjects that they've struggled with. In Western Pennsylvania, we've already kind of showed that we have a long history of natural gas development. Our Amish community has a long history in Western Pennsylvania of producing natural gas from shallow formations. And so they've already had a little bit of a history. They've bought farms over time that already had shallow gas production on it. And so this wasn't as probably as difficult a decision for the Amish community in our, uh, in our neighborhood as it might have been for some others. They've expressed, in meetings with them, they've expressed the same concerns that you and I would have. What does this mean to the environment? What does this mean to my livelihood and my ability to transfer my farm to future generations? And in many cases, the answer to that last question is, it, it, as in a state where, where they will receive royalty rights and receive income from it, that this is an opportunity to provide income to the farm, provide for the, the farm to grow perhaps faster than it would have. It may provide them an opportunity actually to move away to buy a larger farm. But in, in essence, their questions are the same generally that we have, and in general, that they seek information, they show up at, a, at, at our Penn State educational meetings, they ask questions, and I would say generally, at least in Western Pennsylvania, what we've seen is a general accepting of the industry, that they are going to be part of it, that their land is also leased in large measure to natural gas development. And I think that closes me out. Uh, I, I, Dave may have shown the same information if you have a, a desire to seek more Penn State has a great deal of information relating to the issues that we've just talked about, legal issues, environmental issues that we maintain on our website here. So thank you for this morning and your attention.